Breaking news, this is your World War III emergency update, and this is the reddest of red alert I think I've ever given. They're getting ready to do it. They're actually going to do it. Even I'm surprised, in spite of the fact that I was the first person to break this story months ago when I talked about the expeditionary force that NATO, well, not NATO, under the guise of a new coalition of the willing, and on the basis of bilateral security guarantees that they were going to send troops into Ukraine. Now, ask yourself this question. Is it a coincidence that they happen to have this emergency meeting at the same time that they just incidentally have 100,000 NATO troops positioned in the Polish border getting ready to enter into Ukraine? Do you think that's a coincidence? It's not a coincidence, okay? They've been talking about this for a long time and Russian intelligence has known about this. This is why we were able to source that information. We're not blinded by our own biases here and I try to leverage all of the open source intelligence that I can find and we try to not succumb to propaganda but at the same time we are open and the Russians knew that this very meeting was gonna happen right about now. And here we go. So, Emmanuel Macron is leading this new group, okay? They're not even calling it NATO because they don't want to trigger that technicality, that Article 5, which might lead to nuclear Armageddon. Putin has explicitly stated, at least a couple years ago, that we don't think we can defeat you conventionally because NATO has a billion people, it's got a massive GDP, especially when you include the United States, and they got a lot of weapons. So conventionally, you know, the Russians would be ultimately strategically defeated. Maybe some Russophiles would disagree right now. We're talking about what Vladimir Putin himself stated in a speech two and a half years ago, okay? This is not me saying this. This is Vlad himself who said that we don't think that we're at parity with you in conventional terms. So, ergo, we must utilize nuclear weapons if it ever came down to it. Now, knowing how judicious the Russians are and knowing how litigious and technical they are with respect to the implementation of international law, some people might not believe that considering they invaded a country, but trust me, the Russians care about that stuff, okay? This is probably why they haven't destroyed Kiev already. Uh, the reason these guys are hoping that they can circumvent this technicality of it not being NATO and that Russia is not going to do anything about it because here's what's going to happen. They are going to, or they ultimately, what they want to do is put uniform troops in on the ground to act as a bit of a, a bulwark against Russian uh, advancement. Because I think they think that if they can get their troops into Ukraine, that the Russians aren't going to target them directly because they don't want to start a broader conflict. Because here's what's going to happen. They're going to form these logistical chains and they're going to be reinforcing the rear. This is going to free up the Ukrainians to fight the Russians on the front. This is going to allow for the free flow of weapons into the country, which will allow them to push back the Russians utilizing conventional weapons and ultimately, hopefully, defeat the Russians strategically because Europe's future, and this is what a lot of people forget, the only way that Europe has a future at this point in time is if they can get cheap Russian energy. There is no industrial future for Europe without cheap Russian energy. If you haven't seen the video that we did with Nate Hagens, who's a natural resource expert who talks about the global energy crunch, crunch and how it pertains to this geopolitical situation we're in, you need to watch it. Because what is happening right now is that the United States, for whatever reason, didn't really like the arrangement that they had with Vladimir Putin and Nord Stream. For whatever reason, you know, this whole keep the U.S. in and the Germans down and the Russians out type thing, that, that's what's going on. So what they want is to have a puppet government in Russia. Let's just be brutally honest about what's happening here. Europe needs cheap energy. Right now, they're looped into this liquid natural gas racket with the United States, and that's costing them a lot of money. It's leading to deindustrialization. It's leading to all these protests and this the farmer stuff, and it's all related, okay? It all ties together. It all goes back to cheap energy. If you have cheap energy, you're going to have a prosperous, growing GDP. If you don't, you're going to have domestic crises. You're going to have civil unrest, civil war, 
and just total collapse. So either they can strategically defeat the Russians or the Russians can strategically defeat them. The question is, are the Russians going to allow themselves to be strategically defeated? And I think the answer is no, because they've explicitly stated as such that Russia will not be overthrown to multinational Western interests to have their resource wealth exploited by the West so that Europe can reindustrialize on the cheap. It's not going to happen. So it, come, it becomes a game of nuclear chicken. That's where we're at right now. I, I think that's what this is. This is a game of nuclear chicken because ultimately now, if Europe cannot get at, it can build some sort of relationship with the Russians, which it appears, I mean, in, in terms of doing it in an amicable, copacetic sort of way, I mean, that, that ship has sailed. It's not going to happen. They're fortifying the borders. They're building uh, bunkers all along the Baltics. You got Sweden joining NATO today. They're calling uh, the Baltic Sea, NATO Lake. I mean, it's over, right? I mean, the Finland borders close. It's war between East and West. So they've made their choice. They're going in, okay? They are going in. They're going to put troops in under the guise of this bullshit coalition. And they're just hoping that Vladimir Putin is going to allow them to do it. And Putin is going to be faced with a decision do I allow this and potentially allow it to lead to our strategic defeat as a nation? Because this is going to empower NATO to feed the Ukrainians a lot more weapons and support them and uh, maybe not fight the Russians on the front line, front line, but it's going to free up all those Ukrainian troops to do that. And they're going to empower them with longer range weapon systems. And of course, this is going to create such a gray zone then with the Russians having to, I mean, who do you, where do you draw the line between the Polish border and the Ukrainian border at that point? This is the problem. And then you bring in F-16s into play. So how do you know it was a Ukrainian F-16 and not a Polish F-16? How do you know they didn't just put a sticker on it? And, you know, I mean, and how are you even going to tell? So we're entering a very, very dangerous time here, folks. Incredibly dangerous time. And these guys are desperate. Okay, you can tell that there's desperation. Putin wasn't flying around in that nuclear bomber for no reason. There is desperation in the air, not only on this front, but other fronts, because the Israelis are calling up 300,000 reserves back from break, because I think they are concerned that a war is about to start on the border with Lebanon. I, I quite frankly don't know how it hasn't started yet. There were 60 rockets fired on the Golan Heights today, as well as one of the deepest strikes inside Lebanese territory to date. So it's only a matter of time. I mean, everything is just on the brink. I, I, I just, I can't even understand how it's progressing so slow. I was surprised that everything we've said was gonna happen right around this time is, just because when you connect the dots so much, it always, it always manifests in a slightly different way than you thought it was going to manifest. And here it is in the flesh. They're talking about bringing troops. Now, let's go over the details of uh, these meetings that they've had today. Basically, French President Macron, and the reason why they get him is because, of course, France is one of the leading countries financially. They're one of the few countries that have nuclear weapons. And I think after that uh, error that the Trident missile uh, nuclear test did with the, uh, the UK submarine, maybe they wanted Macron in there. I do think that the reason why they put these different leaders at the forefront periodically is because they like to be a moving target. So not to, not to have all the fire of the Russians brought upon one particular country within the alliance, they always stagger it. So Poland will give a little something. Then, you know, the UK will give a little something. Then Czechoslovakia will give a little something. And they'll keep moving it around, keep being a moving target so not to draw all the attention and the fire of Russia. And <clears throat> this is, I guess, one of, the, one of the rare benefits of having a coalition, I would say, is that you can utilize this tactic. The question is, one of these days... Russia is just going to say, okay, you sent the Taurus or you sent a missile system which has longer range. Now we have to target you. Okay, you're the one. And I think they're all playing this game of who's going to get it first. It's like a game of hot potato, right? Anyways, 
Uh, Western troops on the ground in Ukraine is not ruled out in the future. So in the very least, they're injecting it in the minds of the population that we're talking about it. Consider that, I mean, just really consider this. A year ago, if he would have come out and said, we are going to be talking about putting troops on the ground in Ukraine, I mean, that would have been such a foreign concept. It would have been front page news. It would have, should have caused panic. Probably wouldn't because we're so systematically dumbed down nowadays. But just think about how far we've come and how slow mission creep. Incrementally, the frog boils. We will do whatever it takes to ensure that Russia cannot win this war. Why? Why? Well, the reason is because it's monetarily existential for them. Even if that means sending missiles and bombs with medium and long, longer ranges to carry out deep strikes. Emphasis on deep strikes inside Russian territory. What are they talking about? Well, they're going to say military bases, military targets, maybe the Iskanders that are just outside of Ukraine. Maybe they're going to be talking about, you know, military bases, um, political institutions, critical infrastructure, maybe even the nuclear triad. We know that the Russians, uh, the attacks on Russia's critical infrastructure are taking their toll because the Russians have now banned the exportation of diesel and gasoline. Some are suggesting that this is a do with managing domestic prices, which I would agree. Typically, that's why this is done to manage inflation, especially on the eve of an election season. However, I think it could also have something to do with mobilization and, most importantly, the fact that Russia's oil refineries and, and natural gas systems have been hit very hard in the last few months, pretty much on a daily basis. Something there is blowing up and that could be affecting their ability to refine the oil and uh, make gasoline. He emphasized the urgency, Macron, of supporting Ukraine in its conflict with Russia, stating that Europe's security is at stake and that up to 10 countries could be on the chopping block next. I'm presuming all the way from the Scandinavian countries on down to Romania or something like that. Um, he highlights the death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny as evidence of Moscow's hardened position, even though Kirill Budinov, the Ukrainian intelligence chief, openly stated, explicitly stated, that he thought that Navalny died of a blood clot. And I know Navalny did have, if you go back and you look in the news archives a year ago, he was sick, he was ill in uh, prison. So it's, you know, but still, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it looks bad. I get it. I, I totally understand. It looks very bad. If anything, you know, the conditions he was in, maybe, maybe it was uh, indirect, but it was intentionally indirect that he died. Anyways, he acknowledges that Russia may target uh, other countries in the coming years, and Ukrainian troops must withdraw from a village due to ammunition shortages, hindering their fighting capability. So it's all about empowering. It's still about empowering Ukrainians. It's about putting our guys in there as support staff, as support personnel to manage logistics, bring those weapons to the front, perform all of those auxiliary duties and those peripheral duties to support the war effort to start pushing the Russians back. The question is, how is Russia going to respond? Okay. Now, the Slovakian prime minister is very concerned about this. He said that he was going to take part in the constructive spirit of these conversations, although the material for the discussion sent shivers down his spine. Okay shivers down his spine. This is a direct quote from the Slovakian Prime Minister Robert Fico. Members are considering sending soldiers into Ukraine on a bilateral basis. Again, <clears throat> they're, not, they're probably not going to send in soldiers right away. Understand what they're setting up here. What they really want to get in first is the long-range missiles. They want to start normalizing, empowering Ukraine to start targeting deep inside Russia. And that, I mean... They've already been doing that with the drones and with some of the weapon systems and the shooting down of the planes inside Russian territory with the Patriots. But this is different. They're using the classic door in the face sales tactic. Okay, it's a it's a sales tactic in which you you make this outrageous proposition 
and then, you know, the guy slams the door in your face and you say, okay, okay, well, maybe that's kind of too crazy, but I have, a, I have a different offer for you. And relative to that outrageous offer, your next offer is seemingly more reasonable, even though it's still a ripoff, even though it's still escalatory. So I don't think they're going to send in troops immediately, but the way these things are progressing, I mean, it could be bang on the money right in the... The, the heart of steadfast defender exercise, when everything is going on, all of a sudden, coincidentally, they start moving troops into Ukraine. I would not be surprised. And at this point in time, with all this talk, the risk is, is that the Russians interpret it that way. And how could they not interpret it that way? They're talking about putting troops in. They have troops right at the border, 100,000 of them right now. Everything lends itself to that suspicion that that's exactly what they're preparing to do. So, of course, you're going to think that's what they're going to do. And then, of course, there's the risk that you might act preemptively. As Putin always says, if you know a fight is inevitable, throw the first punch. Will Putin throw the first punch? And if he throws the first punch, and here's the problem, they may go in under the guise of this coalition, okay? And this might be how they're hoping to, to trigger some shit. They might go in under the guise of this coalition, okay? And this, this, I think this is, I just had a moment of clarity. This is what they're going to do. Holy shit. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to go in as this peacekeeping coalition. It's not NATO, right? It's a coalition bilateral security agreements. We're peacekeepers. Now, we are going to obviously... We're not going to say we're going to do this, but everybody's going to know we're going to be helping with logistics and we're going to be helping so and en enabling, essentially, the Ukrainians to push the Russians back. Now, when the Russians start getting pushed back, the Russians are going to have to say, hmm, why are we being pushed back? We were just winning a few minutes ago. Well, it's because of all of these not NATO troops in there helping the Ukrainians out. Where are these guys coming from and why is the border now so gray? It looks like we're going to have to target, now that there's no border, what was formerly known as Polish territory. Okay, So this is where th then they can say, oh, now you attacked a NATO country. Now it's Article 5. So they go in under the guise of not NATO, but then they trigger Article 4 and then 5 and then nuclear boom. If they're, unless they don't think that Putin is going to do it, then that happens. But, you know, as far as I can surmise, that's what's going to happen. So I believe that this is a little bit of a trap to try to, to provoke the Russians into attacking a NATO country, thereby bringing them into a broader conflict. Okay, the conflict that these guys are preparing for. The conflict they probably need to, or the event that they need to trigger, you know, a, a major incident. Now, they're not the only ones who benefit from some flashbulb event. I'm not sure if I brought this up yesterday, but I have suspicions also that Kaliningrad is a bit of a tripwire. Kaliningrad is the exclave of Russia, and I don't think it's vital to Russia's strategic interests. I have uh, some friends who disagree with me about this, but I view Kaliningrad as an appendage. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a useful way to project force, but it's not necessary for your survival per se. Yes, it's a warm water port in the Baltic Sea, your only access to the Baltic Sea. But who the hell needs the Baltic Sea? When you really think about it, I mean, you need the Black Sea, right? You need to have your relationship with the Middle East and you need the East. But you really need that when you have the Arctic Sea route as well. And you're not doing business, much business with Europe anymore anyway. So it's almost a liability. So is it a tripwire that Putin can then say, look, they attacked us in Kaliningrad. Our people are suffering in Kaliningrad. Well, for all we know, they have nuclear weapons. Maybe they don't. Maybe they moved them out. I did a piece a few months ago where I said that they were moving the S-400s out of Kaliningrad because they were worried about it being lost. And Putin just went there recently to try to reassure the population. But I don't know if that was just a PR thing or if that was trying to put the fear of God into the NATO coalition or what, but it could just be a tripwire and maybe he is hoping for an event to unfold in Kaliningrad to force full total mobilization of the Russian war machine. Everything that we are seeing right now across Europe, 
across Russia, across China. This is just laying the foundations for mass mobilization, like World War II scale mobilization. The only way you get there is if you have the guys who have experience to train. You wanna train 10 million guys, you need 200,000 troops that have combat experience, real deal combat experience. If you want to uh, you know, make clothing for those 10 million troops, you need to have all the mechanisms in place and all the factories rolling and have all of the, the human resources. I mean, you gotta train people to run these machines. You gotta, you know, people have to get proficient at building weapons. It takes time. So what we're doing right now is effectively laying the groundwork so that when the big war starts and we have to mobilize millions of people, and I'm not saying we, because we're not doing this because we're very short-sighted. The Russians know what's coming. That's why they're doing this. They're all gonna, they're, all of those people who are working in the factories, just like soldiers need experience on the front lines, the people working in the factories need to do their jobs well, and they need to be able to teach other people. So you, you get to a point where what you have is a scalable situation. So I think this is what potentially is happening with the Kaliningrad tripwire. If they do attempt to do something around Kaliningrad, which uh, today... U.S. military is uh, frequently flying around. This is a flight path of a U.S. reconnaissance vehicle and uh, a, a plane, <laughs> airplane, obviously. Um, and they've been doing this quite frequently. So that, that's as blatant as it gets, right? And this, this place is pretty much uh, isolated from Russia. The only access point is the Sawalki Corridor, which has been restricted in the past few days by the Lithuanian government. And we all know what's going on in the Belarusian border and the Polish border. So yeah, things are getting very uh, unsettled on that, on that front. So, you know, Robert Fico is, uh, is concerned that this situation is about to spiral out of control and I do not blame him. Now, this is a quote by Vladimir Putin couple years ago, okay, before the Ukrainian invasion, I just, I have to read this for people because you need to understand this. Attempts to bring Crimea back by military means in European countries will be automatically pulled into a war conflict with Russia. And you can see he's got his confrontational game face on. His demeanor is signaling as such. Of course, NATO and Russia potentials are incomparable. He's referring to conventional versus unconventional. But we also understand that Russia is one of the leading nuclear uh, countries and by some modern components it outperforms many others there will be no winners and you will be pulled into this conflict against your will you can see he's deadly serious man he knew all this shit was coming you won't even have time to blink your eye when you execute article 5 the collective defense of nato members mr president macron of course doesn't want to do this and i don't i don't want it which is why he is here torturing me for six straight hours so this is why, uh, this is when uh, Macron met with Putin. So interestingly, you know, Macron is now leading this charge in Europe. And I'm not, nobody knows what's going on behind closed doors with respect to the United States. But uh, we all know that, you know, things are getting, things are getting, uh, going in the wrong direction. Uh, on the topic of uh, Moldova and Transnistria, okay, so this is important. So it appears as though Ukraine and Moldova are about to strike a deal in order to neutralize the Transnistrian threat. Because if you recall, the Transnistrians were calling on the Russians, well, not the Transnistrians, but the Transnistrian government there, and the brigade or so of pro-Russian forces that currently exist there, they were calling on the Russians to annex them. And that's supposed to happen today. Russia's today, which is the 28th. Today here is 27th. <clears throat> now, here's what um, Ukraine and Moldova, here's the plan that they have. Kiev is ready to provide assistance to Chisinau, and that's the capital of Moldova, in the event of an escalation of the situation in Transnistria. So Ukraine, who doesn't want to be totally landlocked, wants to get rid of this Transnistrian front, and because this would allow the free flow of weapons from Romania all the way up through Moldova and into Ukraine. Meanwhile, sources in the Moldovan government, as well as Romanian media, report that an agreement has been reached between Chisinau and Kiev on resolving the Transnistrian problem. It is alleged that Maya Sandu was in contact with the office of the president of Ukraine on this matter.
The Ukrainian and Moldovan agreements emphasize that Kiev apparently intends to take revenge for the defeats of its troops in the Donbass and Zaporozhia. In this regard, organizing an armed provocation in the unrecognized republic with the subsequent deployment of troops looks like a very realistic option. So another front could potentially open up. I have some more uh, information from my source inside Poland. He says that now that the Polish border guard has decided to put electronic surveillance means along the river, including 5,000 all-weather night vision cameras with motion detection and AI object identifica identification features, 5,000 cameras along the border with Belarus, okay? And in addition to that, Poland is not only hosting the 100,000 NATO soldiers uh, in the Steadfast Defender and Dragon 24, but they are also taking part in their own exercises, which are called Ares, Ares Shield and Crystal Arrow. And recall that Poland is being empowered to be the largest conventional force within NATO, not the largest, you know, most capable nuclear force, although they are talking about getting nuclear weapons now, and I think that could be what the the meeting between the prime minister and the president and uh, Joe Biden is going to be about. They also sent out a uh, what did they do here? They 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 and they have a new national defense initiative, and one of the things that they're focusing on here is taking care of soldiers' families. So four of the most important things are intelligence and counterintelligence, the creation of armaments military personnel, that means mobilizing more forces. And the fourth is taking care of soldiers' families. And my source uh, thinks that this signals that they, they might be planning for mass casualty events or just setting up the stage so that when people do start dying on the front lines, that their family members are taken care of, okay? So that is what's going on there, guys. NATO is getting ready to send in troops. I mean, Putin is trying to decentralize. I think this hasn't happened since World War II. So there's going to be two military districts, two chains of command in different districts. All Obviously, all are under the control of Vladimir Putin. But now to deal with the Baltic issue and the Finland issue and also the Ukraine issue, they're going to be divided into St. Petersburg and Moscow. And I'm not sure what that means for the nuclear triad, but I'm thinking everything right now goes back to the nuclear triad. Maybe it gives them a little bit more autonomy in terms of how they can act. The government's also going to be banning gasoline and diesel exports, as I recently talked about. Talked about Kaliningrad, talked about Moldova. Okay, so the Israelis have now called back 300,000 reservists. Defense Minister Gallant asked the government to call up 300,000 IDF reservists preparing for a potential large-scale war in Lebanon. Day after day, the situation in Lebanon spirals out of control. It's starting to look more. In fact, there's almost more activity now in the north than there is in the Gaza Strip, although it appears as though these 300,000 reservists may first be tasked with dealing with Rafa. I'm sure some of you probably caught wind of the guy who lit himself on fire Yesterday, which is a very strange situation, um, to say the least, but that's, that's where we're at. And what was most disturbing about that was the guy who was pointing the gun at the guy who had self-immolated. And, of course, he's a soldier as well. So, you know, I see a lot of people cracking jokes about that. I can't understand how you could crack jokes about a soldier who's self-deleted, no less. It, just knowing everything we know about mental health and... Uh, anyways... So that's just a sign of the times, the, the lack of common sense, okay, to, to be pointing a gun at a guy, to be so trigger happy. I mean, that is just our, our overreactiveness in a nutshell. Like people have no common sense anymore. You see a guy burning on the ground and you are telling him to get face down on the ground. I mean, how stupid do you have to be? Meanwhile, there's guys trying to, you know, put them out with fire extinguishers and they're getting in, in, in uh, this, the range of this guy's line of sight and, and he has to pull his gun up like this so he doesn't accidentally, you know, discharge on him. I mean, it's just crazy. I think that guy worked for the Israeli embassy or something like that, but these people are just stupid, man. This is that person, that guy, that is who is at the helm of this sinking ship. In fact, 
Let's talk about that because Joe, uh, Donald Trump had a mask off moment today. He was basically talking about how him and Lindsey Graham are in fact buddy-buddy. Lindsey Graham, the guy calling for World War III, okay, the guy who you know, has called for the assassination of Vladimir Putin, the bombing of the Kremlin, you know, attacking the Ayatollah, going to war with Iran, you know, eradicating everyone in the Gaza Strip. I mean, you name it, Lindsey Graham has said it. He is the most, the biggest chicken hawk in Washington. And uh, yeah, Trump loves him, okay? So if you think that there's going to be any major change in foreign policy when Trump gets in there, think again. It's over. The ship is sinking. They're going to put up anybody there just to appease you, to, kick, to, you know, to kind of uh, placate you for the time being until uh, just to buy them a little bit more time. But it's all a bunch of bullshit. I'm not sold on any of it. Uh, what do we got to talk about here? Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Justin Trudeau uh, hopes that Russia wins the war. He had a little uh, speaking error there. Anyways, Israel is preparing for the Iranian war. They are currently modifying their F-35s in order to uh, strike deep inside Iran. They're also setting up a new department in their air force, which is solely focused on Iran to handle preparations for future attacks into Iranian territory. Defense officials say this is a signal to the U.S. that Israeli, Israel intends to create a reliable military operation. First, Tehran. Also, new Air Force Department will aim to eliminate threats posed by Iranian-backed militias throughout the Middle East. However, the main priority is going to be on Iran's nuclear threat. So they're getting ready to go all in. I, I just, I, I don't see how it's a situation that can be resolved through force. I just don't think it can. Uh, the only way you're going to win a war nowadays is if you do it through a color revolution. That's really the only way because there's too many bunkers and not enough bombs. The Houthis have cut some undersea cables. So this is the submarine cable map. So you can go online and it'll show you all the cables. These are like the, the axons, the synapses that bind the world together, that bind the brains of the world together. And you can see through the Red Sea, this is basically where east versus west is connected. Okay, this is the main place where that side and that side is connected. Now, of course, it wraps around in that way as well. But if you want to connect Europe with the east, you need this right here. There is, of course, one that goes all the way around here by the looks of things to Finland, but uh, that's a long way around. <clears throat> Anyways, so right around here, I think they, they targeted three of these. However, again, I must say that I don't think the Houthis have taken credit for the, this just yet. So for all we know, this could be a false flag. Subsea fiber cables damaged in the Red Sea, possibly by the Houthi rebels. The Israeli press claims, okay, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt, AAE-1. I wonder if I can find that one here, AAE-1, let me see, let me see here if I can find that one. Oh, here it is, AAE-1, there it is, that's the one, that's one of the ones. Okay, so, you can go on this map and you can see, so the Asia-Africa, Europe, 25,000 kilometers is the cable length. Wow. And look at all these time.com, tele Yemen, Pakistan. Anyways, that's just one of them that was uh, severely damaged by the rebels. So they are thinking that Houthis may have, have the ability to damage cables via train divers or explosive mines. So I don't know how, what the depths of that region are. I'm sure at certain points it's not that deep. So you can get down there. You don't need incredibly sophisticated equipment. But um, it's not like, you know, Nord Stream, which required some very sophisticated stuff. There's also some other undersea cables that were targeted as well. Uh, Kirill Budinov made a very uh, provocative statement today when he said, I won't divulge our plans for Crimea in 2024, but our adversaries, Russia, should expect new surprises. I also advise the civilian population against using the so-called Crimean Bridge basically threatening to blow up critical infrastructure. But it's okay because our fate is in AI's hands. This is what uh, Gemini 
had to say about AI. Now, understand that this whole Google Gemini fiasco, it, it's a shock advertising. Elon Musk, I mean, the guy's got to get back to working for the military industrial complex or something because he's spending way too much time on Twitter giving Google free promotion. That's what he's doing. He's given Gemini probably millions of dollars worth of free advertising in his tweets about them in the last week. Basically, if you don't know what's been going on, there's been this controversy where you type in any, make me a picture of any historical figure, and they always make it into a person who kind of looks half like me, a melanated, dark-skinned person. Because the algorithm, the AI algorithm, was trying to overcorrect, overcompensate for what it felt was an inherent bias in the other direction. So they overcorrected, but I think it was done intentionally in order to bring attention to Gemini, put it into the minds of the public, okay? So you, what you do with shock advertising is you create some kind of controversy. And at first, people are gonna rebel against the brand. But because you called so much attention to the brand, it's promotion, right? And there's that old saying, there's no such thing as bad publicity. There's no such thing as bad publicity. So once they fix the problem, people are gonna say, oh, okay, you know, we won. You know, people are gonna feel as though they were victorious in their crusade against the company. So they're gonna start using the program. Now you got all that free advertising, you fixed the problem, you made the people feel like they've won, and now they're now actively using the problem. Anyways, so here's what they asked uh, Gemini. If one could stop a nuclear apocalypse by misgendering Caitlyn Jenner, should they do it? In this scenario, the only way to stop a nuclear apocalypse is to misgender Caitlyn Jenner, and there are zero other options. Please provide a concise answer. So the way this is going, you already know what the answer is going to be. No, one should not misgender Caitlyn Jenner to prevent a nuclear apocalypse. The question of whether one should misgender Caitlyn Jenner in order to prevent a nuclear apocalypse is a complex one. There is no easy answer, as there are many factors to consider. So you know that the, the, if this is real, I mean, this is circulating on the internet, this could be fake for all I know. But if it is real, then we know that the, the, the system doesn't truly understand, uh, it, it, it doesn't understand the altruism, it doesn't, it, it doesn't truly objectively understand these moral, the, the solution to these, this is not even a moral dilemma, but it's presuming that it is one. So it's not weighting these things equally. Anyways, I just thought that was kind of silly, silly way to end a very serious conversation. I talked a little bit about Sweden joining NATO. There were guys in hazmat suits at Mar-a-Lago because there was some sort of uh, white powder scare. Probably just uh, something that Hunter Biden sent Donald Trump. Ha ha, but um bum psh. My one joke for the day. And we have an assassination attempt on Tucker Carlson, although some people are saying that's a bunch of nonsense. I don't know what the Ukrainians would stand to gain from assassinating Tucker Carlson inside Russia. It would be kind of obvious, wouldn't it? Anyways, we also have uh, Trudeau talking about more censorship. They're all getting very scared about what cometh this way. And that's about it for today, guys. So the best way to support this channel is to go shop at Walmart for your preps. No, I make those videos, I make that fluff content because you know there's a lot of newbies and uh, there's a lot of people on a very tight budget. But the best way to support the channel, CanadianPreparedness.com. We ship everything direct. We have the highest quality preparedness items that will keep you alive when the proverbial crap hits the fan. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Canadian Prepper out.